Where we plan to take on the world with all this track With our last life We learn to look We learn to cry We learn if you roll and you give up Did they hold you down Long enough Until you knew Would you Hi everyone, my name is Matt Mirage and this is my workshop in Cagawong, Ontario. And uh, I'm going to talk to you guys about what I do, which is making musical instruments, mainly guitars, electric guitars, acoustic guitars, and repair and restoration. And the reason I'm even here is because I have been working on a film with the guys at Wingush uh, about my process in making guitars and uh, my goals, which are to be as sustainable as possible. And it's uh, a real journey to do so. So I'm gonna do a quick shop tour. It's a pretty small space. I work out of 240 square feet with a closet uh, spray booth. And so this is pretty much the whole shop. There's my bandsaw, which does all my resigns. And then, you know, dust collectors, uh, lots of storage, lots of wood, obviously. I could talk about wood all day. And amplifiers, obviously, got to have those. And so I have been working out of this shop for going on five years in September, which is a blessing. And uh, the whole time I've been here, I've been trying to do something, which is get local materials from local sawmills and trying to get even wood that we've salvaged ourselves from furniture, shipwrecks, whatever. Whatever, if it's wood, I'm curious. I want to know what you got. And I've, <laughs> I've put the word out there and people have found me and brought me some really interesting pieces. Actually, I got one of those. Over the years. And so this is a really neat uh, piece. It's called Ironwood. And this is to me the future of a huge portion of the guitar. Uh, we're so lucky on Manitoulin Island to have access to just beautiful specimens of ironwood. And this is a burl, so it's a, kind of like a growth. And I always said it looks like my brain. It's a nice, cool piece of wood. And it's got the craziest pattern on the inside. And so I'm going to turn this into um, head plate veneer. I'll show you what it is. The guitar. This has got a, a laminate veneer. And it's, it's an interesting species to even be using because it's really not that common for, for most woodworking projects because it's just too hard. But on, in guitar making, we really like using ebony for fingerboards. And ebony, as time goes on, it's just becoming more scarce. And I was reading more about it the other day. Just to have a tree that's mature enough to harvest, it's about 70 to 100 years. And so it'll take a few generations before we can actually plant a tree. And that's a tropical tree that grows to be pretty big. But it doesn't grow to be tall, and there are issues with getting it out of the forest because the, the wood is so dense. And so, and ebony is called ebony for a reason. People want it to be jet black, although most of the trees don't yield nearly as much as you would think that is black. So a lot of it just gets wasted. And so there's all these these factors that have made me think, okay.
even before it was a guitar maker, I, I kind of had a forest systems and tree species and and uh, and learned about this ironwood, which totally lives up to its name. It's actually its proper name is hop horn beam, and it's got the same relative uh, density as ebony. It's literally just the same stiffness. And so it's been hard for me to actually find any boards of this stuff. And a few years ago, uh, someone was moving and they were like unpacking this wood and it weighed a million pounds. And there were these thin boards and I was speaking to someone who I know who, who has a sawmill and they said, oh yeah, that's definitely ironwood. And so I have about uh, 50, maybe 40 fingerboards worth that are air drying. So I'm, that's the other part of when I set out to do all this sustainable guitar making stuff, I didn't realize how long it would take me to properly season all the materials. Like this is 10 years ago when I first started. Uh, so I, yeah, I have been doing this for 10 years. Um, and only now some of my material that I harvested 10 years ago is, is starting to, to be where I'd like it to be for as far as dryness goes. And I like to air dry my material. It's, as much as kiln drying is effective when you're a production shop, I have the luxury of only being only having to make a handful of instruments every year. So I could, you know, if I if I time everything properly and and organize myself in a certain way, I could essentially have everything air dried throughout my whole career and not rely on kiln dried wood. So that's where I'm at so far. It's it's getting to be harder as I make more instruments. And I, I've had to buy a few bits of kiln dried wood uh, in the last little while to kind of supplement what, I, what I'm doing. But that being said, a lot of the stuff I have now is over 100 years old. It's been drying for 100 years. That's a whole other story, uh, but I should tell it. It's a good one. <laughs> I, got, I was contacted by uh, someone locally who was moving. It, it seems like when people are moving, they're, they're unloading all the boards that they've been hoarding for years and if you come to a luthier you're going to get top dollar for your, your board and so someone brought me a uh, hundred mahogany uh, that was easily 100 years old and black walnut that was easily 100 years old and then this mystery piece of wood that ended up being brazilian rosewood and um, if you don't know anything about Brazilian rosewood, look it up. Um, it's pretty crazy that I found a slab as big as I did, and uh, it's 100 years old. It's 100 years air dry. So those guitars, I'm I'm waiting a few more years till my skills are a little a little more up to snuff because it's every year I notice I do incrementally get better and uh, to work your way up to using. Brazilian rosewood, you have to, you have to definitely have a level of confidence that it takes years to acquire. And I have to mill it all myself, and I'm kind of afraid because, <laughs> like the sawdust, the sawdust is is more valuable than most other things in my shop. It's crazy how much this board is actually worth. And so uh, we're looking at it as when I make those guitars, that's going to be my daughter's education <laughs> in in like seven guitars because uh, when you when you use brazilian rosewood it's hard to not sell a guitar for seven or eight or nine thousand dollars and uh, quite frankly i there's i have a whole sort of sort of moral i have moral issues with that, that being in that price point currently so maybe i can be corrupted as time goes on but uh that being said, it's intimidating when you come across a piece of wood that you know could could change the, your career path. And so I'm going to sit on it for a bit <laughs> because I've still got a lot to work up to. And, and that being said, it, 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 I have issues with using something like Brazilian Rosewood uh, because it is pretty much extinct. 
And so it doesn't fall in line with, with what I believe in. And so even talking about like, oh, I'm going to make these guitars in the future and they're going to be made out of this wood. And, and I'm going to say, well, I'm a sustainable guitar maker. And someone's going to go, well, how are you using Brazilian rosewood? And that's a great, that's a great question. And all I can say is this was cut a hundred years ago when everyone was cutting the cutting trees in a way that they treated them as though they were infinite. And I think it took till about the 60s for people to realize, oh, I guess trees are not infinite. We can level an entire forest and ecosystem and, and it, it may not regenerate itself. And so, and it's so bad with this one species, Brazilian rosewoods, that the trees that are that do exist are being poached and are under threat. And, you know, the, the viability of the species is, is very much like touch and go. And so I had even debated with just selling the board and going, I'm just going to sell the slab, you know, to get a, a substantive amount of money for it. And then I was talking to someone, a guitar maker, and they actually said, why don't you just build seven guitars with it? It's the only time you're ever going to use it and just pay for your kid's education. And I was like, oh my God, that's genius. So it's funny how I'm going to try and, and position myself, but sometimes you have to, you have to be a hypocrite. And, but most of the time I'm going to try to not be. And I got some really funny stories about how, like last year, I ended up inheriting a Luthier from uh, Massey, Ontario, who passed away. And uh, his family was you know, getting rid of everything in the house. And there was a lot of stuff. And I couldn't imagine if someone had to deal with all the stuff in this place. And so his family had a dumpster. And the dumpster was full of just guitar making everything. And I'm talking, when I showed up, the thing was full to the brim. And so I spent a solid hour going through a dumpster. And I ended up scoring uh, 20 ebony fingerboards amongst some uh, rosewood veneer and all these things that I generally was like, trying to avoid by all means. I'm, I'm trying to get away from using any exotic wood species altogether. That's my ultimate, ultimate goal because in the last few years I've been able to make examples of guitars that are completely domestic. The spruce soundboard is from British Columbia. Uh, the back and sides, I really like maple. I have some great examples. I'll show them to you. They're from Chigang, which is amazing, which is where is from. And uh, I got that from uh, Carter Sawmill, and I, it's amazing when you were the local mill. I mean, this stuff was only dried for a year or two, and I, I'm still drying it. I'm going to dry it for another five or six years before I actually get to use it. But it's that being able to have access to the materials, putting in the work, putting in the, the time, and, and making sure that you're treating it right. You know, it's, it's a process, but I think in the long term, it's really going to pay off because I'm going to be able to make it examples for instance, literally everything was was harvested within 150 to 200 kilometers so i'm pretty excited about that it's a journey i'm uh, looking if anyone's watching and knows where to get big spruce logs eastern white spruce please let me know um it's something that i really would like to incorporate into my guitars i think it's the it's the final link into making a completely northern ontario all local wood uh, acoustic guitar i mean i've been, i'm going to show you an electric guitar I made that uses all domestic northern ontario wood and some of that dumpster dive uh rosewood which is funny i i, I think if i'm going to use any of these species if they were dumpster dived i don't think it gets more sustainable than that pretty funny so i'm going to show you a couple things um one of the wood species that I'm really interested in using is apple. And being on Manitoulin, we are surrounded by apple trees. I mean, it's like apple mecca. This, I'm going to try and find a better spot here. This is apple wood. And it was hit by lightning. And so, when we were harvesting this tree, we knew like this is God. This is God of life. 
you hold this and you're like, this is not a regular piece of wood. And this was actually harvested about 10 minutes away from my house. And this tree has been dead for, it looks like it's been dead for at least 20 years. years. And so that's another big part of what I'm trying to do is find trees that, if we're going to use trees that are local, if they're not in, in tip top health or they're already dead, we'll take portions of them and uh, generally rule of thumb is you leave as much as you can to decompose to help go back to the ecosystem so you're not just taking all and everything all the time. So, here's some maple. This is from Chigang. This is from Corvier Sano. Now, This is like crazy bird's eye maple. And I just want to acknowledge that all of this material, every time, every time I use a piece of wood, it's like, it's not just going to be another commodity. There's a lot of thought that goes into it. And there's a lot of, you know, I, I care about every piece as much as the next. It's like, Hard to, it's hard to explain, but I try to I try to make every instrument meaningful and not just something that is repeated and something that is just another commodity. Like it, it truly is a piece of my artistic vision, meeting you know a lot of a lot of the passion that I have for making guitars. And and every guitar I make is is really different. Actually, if you'd like to look at some of my work. You can check out uh, mirageinstruments.com. Go look at my name. That's my M-A-R-A-N-G-E-R, instruments.com. And, uh, you know, if you see anything, you want to ask me a question, go ahead, because I'm sure I'll have some questions soon enough. So, uh, but I think I'm going to show you a little more of the guitars to talk a little more about them. So here is... I'm calling this my COVID-19 build. I started this March 13th. So I can't remember when the lockdown was, but it was around then. I finished it April 19th. And I mean, I was working on 30 or 40 other projects, but this one in between everything else. And uh, this is actually, you can't tell, but the top is, Spruce, Northern Ontario Spruce. It's the only one I've got, actually. I got it from someone who pulled it out of their attic as strapping. And uh, it's quarter sawn, which is like the preferred way to cut anything that a luthier would like to use. So to, perhaps, to have someone come with quarter sawn spruce and go, hey, I think you would use this, uh, was pretty cool. And so I managed to get this top uh, out of that. Forward. And this is a piece of maple that was also taken from that dumpster. Uh, the cherry taken from the dumpster and the rosewood was taken from the dumpster. So this is kind of like a, I got all the wood for free guitar. <laughs> and so the reason for even painting it pink was kind of accidental. I wanted it to be orange, but I'm just getting into painting guitars because I had recently found um, a finish that is water-based, so it's not solvent-based, which I'm a big fan of. And then I found a pigment that really works well with water-based, which is Mixol. Actually, the finish I use is Target Coatings MTech 6000. And I'll use, uh, this one is the satin. No, this one is a semi-gloss. And I... I've used the satin, but I'm not I'm not sold on it yet. But great product. Uh, from what I can tell, when I spray and I leave the room, I use, I wear a full full hazmat suit. Uh, but generally, five minutes later, it doesn't have any odor. If there's no smell. There's there's no uh, the off gassing is is minimal. It's really it's a really neat product and. I encourage everyone who 
is even working with wood to check out target coatings because they're like the leader in, in water-based uh, to me they're like one of the best brands for water-based finishes and they make an acrylic lacquer so uh, we can get into like polyurethane and varnish and the different types of, of finish but what i like about lacquer and this one in particular is it performs a lot like true nitrocellulose lacquer it's about as close as it gets without killing you and i sprayed nitro till my 33rd guitar and then I said no more and I I've attempted French polish actually the neck on this is a French polish this is a really neat neck this is cherry but I dyed I dyed my necks using a mixture it's like a it's this really gross concoction of steel wool nails and vinegar and so you, you I had this really nasty jar of stuff that's just it just lives there and it's amazing it's the best black dye natural organic black dye you'll ever find and it's literally just pickling vinegar and, and your random steel trash and so uh that's been really neat to experiment with color it's it's new to me i i this is my fourth guitar that i painted with color and it's, it's a really interesting challenge i'm I, I'm just getting into making electric guitars again. I had kind of got out of it out of it because I thought I thought acoustic guitars. Um, how do I say it? I guess I was a bit of a snob for a while, <laughs> where I thought acoustic guitar making is the is the only real guitar making, and electric guitar making is kind of like fortified making a cutting board and putting a neck on. And it can be if you want it to be that, but then I woke up one day and said, oh, I don't want it to be that, but I could, I could still use what I know uh, from art shop making and acoustic guitar making and incorporate it into electric guitars. And then I got excited again. And I feel like I've been making really, really cool electric guitars that I haven't seen do things that I would like to see. This one is a really interesting unit because the tremolo, uh, I don't, it's the first one I've ever done. Uh, and I find with the, this is a Jazz Master pickup from Curtis Novak. And the, this body is chambered, it's hollow. And actually this guitar weighs very little. It seems like it would be heavy because it's big. It, it also is super thin. It's only about an inch and a quarter on the edge. Uh, generally your electric guitar is two inches. And so, uh, it being light and hollow and with a spruce top, it really is a resonant guitar, even acoustically. I don't know how well you can hear that, but um, this thing is really, I want to keep it, I really do. So um, <laughs> it's, it's interesting as you're, when you're a guitar maker, because then you, you make something and you think, it's hard, you can have a vision and that sometimes when you put it together, sometimes that vision can kind of exceed your expectations. And I'm not, I'm not trying to toot my horn here, but sometimes you surprise yourself. And I did definitely with this one. I, I kind of did a few things that I don't normally do. And uh, yeah, it's kind of amazing when, the result is something like this, and, and even as the maker, it's hard for me to, to to be positive about my own work because I think as an artist, it's it's, too, it's very easy to be the critic. It's very easy to to see every little detail, and I'm trying to learn to just step back and and just look at it as a whole. Uh, I I used to be a graphic designer. I I took painting classes and sculpting classes. And, a variety of, of disciplines in art school that I studied and I find yeah I find it's all coming together in in the last little while with with these, these latest instruments so um, maybe I should plug this one in and just give you guys a little run through it's a neat little guy I called it life is peachy because you know COVID has been great for for us all and I think we just needed to. Everyone needs a little pink guitar in their life. Just that. <laughs> 
Gloria Panaches, Panache? sorry if I can't pronounce your name, but great question. Uh, all, all woods will definitely have an influence on the sound of a guitar, but a lot of guitar makers will say that it's really the way that the parts are assembled. So certain guitars will have certain, we call it like, there's a lot of, general terms for describing sound. And then you can kind of get into the, the more descriptive words. And, and one that I like to use is color. And I know that's very abstract when it really sound, but color is, is what makes a guitar unique. And one that is colorful generally responds in a very large, broad range of, of, of harmonic responsiveness. You know, it's, it's a, and you can have instruments that are very tight and they just, they kind of have like that horn effect where they're just notes right in your face. And so the wood definitely can play a part in that. Like I think mahogany can be really punchy. It, can be re it delivers a very strong, what we call fundamental. And, and then spruce uh, has so many different varieties and every one of them, definitely has a different color. Uh, and I think a lot of makers have one that they gravi gravitate toward. And I've noticed that makers over time tend to use only one or two different spruces and they're really familiar with them. And so I, I have a preference for Engelmann spruce, which is grown in BC. It's a softer, uh, more dynamic, more responsive right away, but uh, it's it's also you can if you if you don't know how to use it right it can be really aggressive you can almost have an acoustic guitar that distorts and so the wood definitely in every way affects the sound but also the way that the maker assembles every piece has much more of an influence and so that's where the experience comes in and there's so many different tricks to I shouldn't call them tricks but there's so many different methods to affecting the sound. And it is, when we talk about woodworking, it's a, it's a reductive process. And it's rare that when you, when you remove something that you can put it back. And generally in Israel making, you don't have that opportunity. So uh, one thing that I just started doing, which is stringing up the instrument before it has a finish. And we call it stringing it up in the white. And you can actually manipulate You'll, you'll have a better idea of what your guitar may sound like once you put a finish on and, and, and actually finish the whole instrument. And so that way we all have more of an ability to manipulate the overall sound. 
And that's, that's what I really love about this craft is that over time I learned so many new methods. I'm trying, I'm going to start experimenting with this uh, Childiani uh, tuning method, which uses an external speaker and sand and, and sawdust to sh give you a visual representation of the frequency in which the, the, the top is, is responding. It's all kind of nerdy, uh, heady stuff, but it's, it's amazing what what can happen when you go down the rabbit hole of, of making these noise work. And I think the whole, the whole craft revolves around the question that you just asked. And I think that's the million dollar question. And quite frankly, I, I think you should ask me in five years and in 10 years and in 20 years and in 30 years, because I, I know that as time goes on, I'm going to change my opinion about even, maybe there are wood species that are just more musical than others. And I've read that, but I'm not there to believe it. It's because uh, I find there's a lot of how do you say that hype behind certain wood species, like Brazilian rosewood I was talking about earlier. It has a tremendous amount of hype, and a lot of really great makers have said we have so many great alternatives to that. Why are we still using this this wood species? And I think it has a lot to do with um, collecting. And I personally, as a guitar maker, it's hard to not uh, appreciate where collectors are coming from and, and the, the relationship you can have with them because they can, they can definitely help elevate your, your craft and, and anyone's support is, is great when you're an artist. And so uh, it's hard to, to still keep that integrity that you have while not you know completely compromising everything you believe in for money and so uh this is where i'm at with using domestic wood species and i've got a few i've got a great example i'll go get it in a second of uh it's like my third all domestic acoustic guitar and it only uses it's walnut yellow cedar and uh, oh yeah, it's a walnut fingerboard that I dyed black. Oh, we'll get it. It's a really beautiful guitar. So this is number 42. And it's got a little side sound for it. It's, a, it's a, in a Selmer Machia Ferry. It's a sort of inspiration behind the body shape. Very nice. I find it, it's kind of an Art Deco inspired. This head, head plate veneer, let's get it right in there. That is English bog oak. So talk about another wood species that is worth looking up, English bog oak. So these trees fell into a bog somewhere in England uh, 3,000 years ago. And then they were uncovered. I mean, I took these from a shipwreck and the ship was built in 1820 and sank in the 1880s in the bay, you know, like 300 feet from, from our house. And so it's, 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 a, it's a very layered piece of wood just subtly on the, on the veneer plate. And so English bog oak was, it's essentially a semi-petrified wood and it has crazy strength. It, it doesn't even make sense. When you work it, it smells like, it smells like it's on its way to being fossilized. So it almost smells like petroleum, but I know it, it was not, it's not possible for it to have been soaked in petroleum because of the time in which it was processed. So there's all these layers to it and I started reading about it and what I'm smelling when I work with this wood is the process of petrification. So blew my mind. And uh, I've got I've got enough of this to do probably a hundred guitars uh, the face plate and I've done the bridge. The bridge on this one is out of that and a couple other pieces. And so and that again was 
my friend Stephen Regulovich. I, I got to mention his name. He's, he's pretty much hooked me up with a lot of this obscure, unusual wood. Uh, you know, dug out a massive slab. I can't even carry the piece. It's so big. And so uh, I'm looking forward to milling all that up into usable stuff for guitars. And that's really what I would hope to continue to do for for the duration. So I'm going to go put this stuff back. I'm going to show you guys another guitar. <laughs> this one. This one. This one is made with 100 year old. Look at this up. Japanese rainbow mahogany. What does that even mean? I don't know. I've been told it doesn't exist anymore. And so there's another circumstance where this is some of that wood from, from the fellow who was moving and here we are, you know, I've turned it into a guitar. This is 100 year old wood, so I'm pretty excited about how this guitar sounds right away. Usually this has got a sick of spruce top. I've had this top for 10 years since I started. Um, and so I noticed it's got a really nice responsiveness right away. And I just find a guitar, a guitar that's a week old. I think this thing is about only about 10 days old max um usually doesn't perform like the way that i'm having this one is performing right now it's kind of it's kind of blowing me away a little bit and i i haven't really done much outside of my regular process other than use quite old material and so uh, you're playing Beatles for you and uh, yeah this is actually for a customer of mine Steve Armstrong he I know he's pretty excited to get this thing and he's probably really jealous that I'm playing it but the perks of being a guitar maker so I'm gonna get my last guitar for to show you guys This one, this one I made for and with the guys from Wingush. I actually tried to get them to work on this guitar, and every time they just refused. And I and I said, guys, like you're you're here, you're helping me. 
you know, well, you're not helping me apparently. So no thanks to Johnny and Nano. But anyway, thanks for, uh, but they were here helping me film, I guess. But So I guess I should talk about that a little bit. Um, Neil Dabosky, who has Fuel the Fire TV, uh, he had me on his podcast uh, last uh, last year, and we got to talking about this idea. He, he kind of had his mind blown when he realized that all these, these things, these guitars, all the pieces of wood are literally made out of thin air in the sense that, you know, they're converting the CO2 to oxygen. And he had this idea where we would talk about the process of, yeah, like because I, I also believe that there is a disconnect in guitar making, where we forget that they're natural things, like these are beings, they're, they're creatures, they're, you know, they, they're ancient. And I know that the, a lot of the First Nations people, a lot of my friends believe that, you know, they're our ancestors, they're our grandfathers. So uh, I believe that as well. It makes sense to me. And so we're definitely trying to show people that this is, uh, this is a natural organic thing. And the, and the more that I'm trying to, the way that I'm trying to do it is really keep it as close to that as, as we can without, you know, within reason, because I still want to make a guitar that's going to last a hundred years. That's my goal every time. And, and still have it be an attractive, functional, check all the boxes. And so this is the, the culmination of all that years of, of getting here. Um, this is my teardrop arch top uh, offset guitar body design. And I'm really happy with this. This has been like one of the first, the first ones that I've made that I've thought like, oh, like we should, we should go to a guitar show with this. And so unfortunately all the guitar shows that I applied to this year got canceled and I had big plans. This is the one I was going to bring this and go, yeah, I, I like making guitars. <laughs> and so uh, it's unfortunate that that didn't happen, but I still have this. And so a little bit about it. It's, I called this one the space invader got like a little bit of an alien inlay. And then uh, it's got like inlay is kind of in all these weird little spots all over the guitar. And I've even got some, I've got one there. And so, and they're like, they were inspired by ladybugs, but then I had someone say, oh, they look like space invaders. And I said, oh, that, that's, that's what I meant. They're, they're space invaders. And so, uh, and it's kind of a futuristic Art Deco inspired design uh, using, favorite part of this whole build is a really, it's not even anything crazy, but it's the bridge. I don't know how I can show this. So the bridge has this wedge, this little piece here. You can pull on it and it will lower the action and you can push it in and it will raise the action. And it still gives me wood to wood to wood contact with the top. The top is like your speaker uh, when it comes to an acoustic guitar. And so you don't want to have anything that could dampen the point between the strings, which is your what produces the energy that excites the top. And so to have the, the ability to still adjust my action, but have wood to wood contact, it's awesome. And that's Jimmy D'Aquisto, who came up with that back in the seventies, I think. And it's not common and it's unfortunate because it makes a lot of sense. But I'm gonna stop talking and I'm gonna play a little left.
show you guys another project that we're working on. <laughs> Which is this. Now I've shown you all the guitar stuff. And the reason I'm called Mirage String Instruments is that I uh, I just don't make guitars. I make other, other things. And so this is my first five string banjo. And we've got a uh, short scale on it with a full size pot. This is goat, goat skin. I just stretched it the other day. Pretty funny story. It's uh, really hard to do this. And as, a, as a, an instrument maker and a woodworker, you have pretty tight tolerances. And so I was three thousandths of an inch off. It's about a, it's, it's half a hair to, to actually be able to fit this skin. It actually goes under this, this ring and then back through again. And there's a little, uh, there's a, like an old coat hanger, brass coat hanger that I use as a flesh hoop. And I couldn't get it to fit. And so my brother-in-law, because of COVID, everyone's working from home. He was out visiting and so he was working next door. And he heard me hulk out <laughs> and full on lose my mind trying to stretch this thing, but I did it. And that's the amazing thing about this craft is that 
um, I mean, I've seen people who just, they can repeat themselves and I, and I have a lot of respect for people who can repeat themselves and, and keep their sanity. Uh, uh, I personally have a hard time with that. So that's why I tend to, to take on sometimes things that I, sometimes I shouldn't, but I do. And I'm, in the end, I'm glad I did. It's this weird relationship I have. I've learned a lot about uh, joinery on this instrument. Uh, this, this, this wooden tenon is actually uh, got a huge dowel in and fits right into this heel. And they're glued together and then I pin them together with a brass pin. And it's amazing how strong the structure is. It's, it's really cool. Uh, I've never made a banjo like this and it's, it's probably one of the most complex woodworking projects you could ever do. Even as a, uh, someone who has a lot of experience with making instruments. And one thing I, I really, I'm excited to play this thing because I also play banjo. It's the only other instrument I play. And so probably why I took this on because I kind of selfishly wanted to experiment with Luke as my guinea pig. Thanks, Luke. And uh, we came up with this really neat fretless banjo that actually uses that. This is English bog oak from the bay for the fingerboard and the head plate. So again, I, I really am taken by this bog oak. Uh, it's, it's incredible to work with something that is semi-petrified. It has this, it weighs nothing and it's stiff, stiff, stiff. It, it truly is astounding when you start discovering these new materials and they just like blow your, they blow your expectations out of the water. And uh, anyone who's come to me in the last year for an instrument, I show them this and they go, oh, I, I want that. That's, that's like nothing I've ever seen. And I think that's really neat that that the story actually resonates with people. Tell them about my friend harvesting it and, and you know, the story about it being a shipwreck and the story of it being in a, bow, a bog for 3,000 years. So uh, it's, every every piece of wood has, has history. Um, and I try to like, it's really neat if I can find, find out good portions of that, of the tree's history to relate it to people. Uh, even if it's, you know, where it came from. I guess like knowing, hey, that, that maple came from around the corner. You know, uh, I know the maple I bought came from Killarney. Which I, I think that's really neat. It's not, it's, well, it came from Chiging, a sawmill in Chiging, from someone who is logging uh, elsewhere. And so um, it's still pretty local to me. And anything that is a Northern Ontario wood species, uh, if anyone's out there who has something really neat, uh, I'd like to know, like I, a few species I'd like to see are uh, lilac. I know that old, people have some really old lilac and I've seen some that is really solid. It's just, the issue is getting it to me as soon as possible if you do have it because it will check. It's one of these, it, and checking means just it'll crack and it'll dry really quickly. Uh, but it's got purple, it's got purple rings. And so every other, uh, when you're looking at the winter and summer growth, the, the, the winter growth sometimes is purple. And so uh, really interested in that. Sumac. If anyone has sumac, uh, I know that it's endangered. I know that uh, it's, it's a really special coveted wood species as far as I know like a lot of traditional practices, they really, like sumac is really important. And so I'm not advocating for anyone to go cut a 100 year old sumac, but if there is a, uh, if you just so happen to know of some fallen sumac that uh, is like four or five inches in diameter or something like that. I mean, that's an ancient sumac, but it's got the coolest wood. It's got yellow and black rings and white wood. So it's, it's, it's really interesting. I've seen, First Nations carvers do some really, really beautiful, simple work just based on the wood rings. And so uh, incorporating species that really are not traditionally found on instruments, uh, I think is really cool and a big part of what I'd like to do.
And so, yeah, so anyone who's watching all this stuff, um, thanks for watching. Uh, if you have any more questions, I think we've got about five minutes left. And uh, otherwise, I will probably just play you guys another song. That's cool. So thanks for tuning in. And uh, again, if you want to get a hold of me, you can get a hold of me at www.mirageinstruments.com. Um, if you want to chat about wood, it's my favorite topic on the planet. So by all means, send me an email, send me a text. And uh, thanks a lot.
when we knew we should Where we plan to take on the world with all this trash With all 